Hopefully the lectures so far have convinced us, at least to some extent, of two things. The first thing is that we probably shouldn't start off by trying to tackle the general optimization problem without restricting, to some extent, the types of functions we can work with, the types of objective functions and the types of constraints. Because we saw in the first lecture that the, the general optimization problem has so many facets, there are so many special cases that we can't really expect to be able to handle all of them. And from a computational point of view, there are a lot of pretty alarming unknowns that we don't know how to deal with. Things like what happens if we have uh, solutions that involve things like square roots, numbers that we can't easily represent. Um, the other thing that hopefully we've been convinced by at least a little bit is that if we leverage some of the properties of convex sets, it might make our life a lot easier. So in that last lecture when we talked about convexity, um, I went over, at least intuitively, this idea that we have these conditions that mean that if we have a convex feasible region, for our optimization problem, then deciding whether we've actually found the optimal solution is a lot easier. And we're gonna keep going down that path today. What I wanna talk about is, again, something that's a bit of an intuitive subject, but it's the, ge the geometry of a linear program. So what does a linear program actually represent geometrically? I think that talking about a bit more intuition will be very helpful because we're going to rely on a bunch of theoretical results, but I don't think we're at a point yet where even stating those theoretical results fully really helps us understand anything about the problems that we're trying to solve. If we proceed a bit further, maybe we have a better idea of what these results actually mean uh, once we understand how to visualize a linear program geometrically. So we'll start with this. Um, I mentioned in the previous lecture that uh, a line, so the set of all points satisfying this equation, 3y minus x equals 0, this line happens to be a convex set. If I take any two points that are actually on the line, then maybe it follows, maybe it's obvious, but the entire line segment between them on the line is also on the line. And therefore, um, the line does meet the definition to be a convex set. I mentioned also in the last lecture that lines are unique in this sense. Um, if I take some other curve in the plane and I only look at points that are actually on that curve, it's not going to be a convex set unless the curve turns out to be a line. Um, and it's worth considering, uh, this is only if I'm talking about the curve itself being a set of points. We can use other curves to be uh, the boundary of a convex set. So I could define a set to be all points that are on this curve or on this side of the curve. And that might be a convex set. But as far as the curve itself, the set of all points actually on a particular curve, that's going to be a convex set if and only if the curve is actually a straight line. Now, the reason that I bring up lines again in this lecture isn't so much that I want to define a convex set out of the line, but in fact, I actually want to define a convex set bounded by this line. So I can use the line to partition the plane into convex sets. Uh, for example, I could take every point that is on the line plus every point on this side of the line. And I end up with something called a half space. So a half space is uh, for any number of dimensions. I'm working in R2 here because my slides are two dimensional. Um, but a half space uh, is the set of all points defined by um, some linear inequality. So all points that satisfy some linear inequality. Um, we'll notice as we go on that I have a particular affinity for using the less than or equal to sign everywhere. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them is that we'll see in the next lecture that, that uh, for congruence with the books that we're using, um, using less than or equal to signs puts us in a standard form that we can work with. Um, but uh, if I take all the points that are on or below this line or all points that satisfy this linear inequality, I end up with something called a half space and it is convex. Uh, it's also worth considering that we could flip the inequality. We could use greater than or equal to zero, and we would still get a half space. The set of all points that are on the line or uh, above it, um, intuitively, that is a convex set as well. And it's worth observing. So in linear programs, we will see occasionally this type of inequality, and we will see this one. We will see both less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. It's worth considering that uh, lines have this other unique property, which is if I take the set of all points, let's go back to this diagram, if I take the set of all points that are on the line or on this side of the line, 
I'm gonna end up with a convex set. If I take the set of all points that are on the line or on this side of the line, I will end up with a convex set, guaranteed. So either of those two half spaces produces a convex set. That is a property that I can't expect out of other curves. So one example we saw in the previous lecture was I could take this parabola here and I could say, give me all points that are on or above the parabola. And it turns out that that is a convex set. OK, great. So I could define something similar to what I've defined here, this half space. I could define something similar. It wouldn't be called the same thing for this parabola. The difference is if I say, OK, give me all points that are on the parabola or below it, that will not be a convex set. There's sort of an obvious concavity there. And so although other curves can be used to define the boundary of a convex set, in some cases, not every curve qualifies for this, although other curves can be used for that, um, we can't necessarily assume that the, that the set we define will be convex. If I take all points on or below the parabola, I don't get a convex set. If I take all points that are on or above, then I do, which means if I'm working with constraints that are defined with nonlinear functions, I may still have to check whether or not the constraint defines a convex set. But I don't have to do that for lines. In general, I don't have to do that for half spaces, for the sets of points defined um, to be all those points that satisfy some linear inequality. It is guaranteed to be convex regardless of which side of the line I'm on. And of course, that's a big deal because it means I, know I no longer have to check that property. The fact that it's linear is enough to demonstrate that it's convex. Another thing we should observe, uh, we'll go back to this one here, is that uh, if I take a particular point, let's try 0, 0, the origin. Um, maybe you can verify to yourself that 3, mi 3 times 0 minus 0 is definitely less than or equal to 0. Um, that means that the point 0, 0, so there it is, it actually lies on the boundary. Uh, and we can think, OK, if this is a line that goes through the origin, maybe it's obvious where I'm getting the term half space. It sort of very neatly divides the plane in half. Um, but what if I want to have uh, a convex uh, half space that's defined uh, that doesn't go through the origin? What if I want the origin to not be included or to be a strictly interior point? Um, if we use this representation here, where we keep uh, all the constants on the right-hand side, what I can do um, is by changing that constant, I can shift the half space uh, in a particular direction. So notice in this case, the point 0, 0, the origin, is now a strictly interior point. Um, and I guess the natural next question is, wait, which direction am I shifting it? So we saw that the origin was previously on the boundary, and now the boundary is somewhere else because I changed this number to positive 3. What does that tell us? Like, What direction am I actually moving the boundary? Did I move the boundary up? Did I move the boundary to the left? Um, I'll talk about that point in a minute. But the key thing here is that I can actually adjust where the half space boundary is by adjusting that constant on the right hand side. And not that it's terribly relevant to this course, but an interesting philosophical thought experiment is that I still claim, regardless of how far I shift the boundary, that it's still, that the name half space still applies. That regardless of where that boundary actually is, whether it goes through the origin or not, it still quite neatly divides the plane in half. Um, if you want to think about that, we can talk about it. In the office hours. Um, in general, if I'm looking of an, at some equation of this form, so some linear combination, um, and then uh, bounded above by some constant, then I'm going to get a convex set in any case. Uh, formally, it wouldn't be a half space unless at least one of the coefficients is non-zero. If every coefficient is zero, then what I'll end up with is this sort of vacuous statement is, you know, that zero is less than k, which, of course, assuming that k is a positive or zero, that k is non-negative, um, the set that I end up with will be just the entire plane. So uh, it wouldn't be a half space in that case. If at least one of the coefficients is non-zero, then we've got a half space, and the half space will be convex. Um, now that we're talking about these arbitrary n-dimensional linear combinations, it might be a good time to suddenly bring in some vector notation. Um, and the way I said that makes it sound like I'm only bringing it in to um, save myself some writing, which is sort of true. But it's also because if we can turn things into vectors and talk about them that way, we can employ what we already know about vectors. So we can begin visualizing things as vectors, which I think is a really good idea. But before that, what notation are we going to use? Well, uh, if I have this linear combination, c1x1 plus c2x2 all the way to cn times xn, 
what I can observe, given that the only variables that I'm expecting to change here the, the, are these x variables. So in an optimization problem, we would expect x1, x2 up to xn to be the optimization variables and c1, c2 up to cn to be constants. Why don't I separate them into two vectors? So I'll make a vector called c of all the constants and a vector called x of all the optimization variables. And then I will observe that this linear combination is just their dot product. So I could rewrite um, this linear inequality this way by defining these two vectors. And then I could observe that the set of points that, fit, that actually lie on the boundary are the ones where the inequality is met at equality. And that you might recognize equations of this form from a linear algebra course. Um, this would define in two dimensions a line, in three dimensions a plane, or in general, if I have n dimensions, some n minus one dimensional uh, hyperplane. But the reason that I actually bring this up is because now that we can visualize these things in terms of vectors, we can begin visualizing vectors, which might really help. I uh, personally, I find that really helps me understand what's actually going on with these half spaces. So uh, this half space we've been working with, 3y minus x is less than or equal to 0. I'm going to just do a quick derivation over here. So I wrote it out in the way that people often try and write equations to look friendly, which is to try and keep a, a negative sign off of the leading term. But if I write it out with the variables in the order we usually expect, we end up with negative x plus um, 3y is less than or equal to 0. And if I look at the format given on the previous slide, um, what I want to do is I want to create two vectors, a vector of the constants and a vector of the variables. And I do that, well, okay, the vector, the um, constant on x is just negative 1, and the constant on y is 3. So I can, I can separate it out into uh, 1, 3, dot product x, y. Uh, whoops, there's no other, uh, other dot there. And so uh, I have this. I, I can now define the half space I've already been working with in terms of this vector equation c dot x is less than or equal to zero. And one of the reasons why I think this is a nice way of representing things is that I was able to just pull the vector c directly out of the inequality. It was pretty easy to turn this into my vector c by just looking at the coefficient of each variable. And even better, I now have a vector in two dimensions. And I even have this visualization sort of begging to have a vector added to it. And I can do that. If I draw the vector onto my diagram, I end up with this. And notice that there is, it, it actually does seem to have a very nice intuitive geometric interpretation. The vector c uh, equals negative 1, 3, um, this is drawing it without regard to magnitude. We only care about the direction for the point that I'm trying to prove here. Uh, it is what is called the normal vector of the line, of the boundary that defines the half space. Um, and it has the property, if we, if we stare at this equation a bit longer, and we think about what does it mean for a point to be on this line? Well, we saw on the previous slide that a point is on the line if it meets the inequality at equality. So I could rewrite that. I could actually rewrite the equation for the line to be, this would be c dot x is equal to 0, um, where, sorry, I guess in this case x equals the uh, combination x, y. Uh, and then I look at that even further and I say, wait a minute, equals 0. A dot product equals 0. Well, that means that if I take any particular vector along the direction of the line, then I should expect that vector to be perpendicular, to be orthogonal to my vector c. And so we can actually reason, like, it's pretty easy to put together some derivation that demonstrates to us that this vector c um, is orthogonal to the line itself. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we call it the normal vector of a line. It actually is a way of defining the line. I can actually define the line as being all points or when uh, visualized as a vector that would be orthogonal to this, uh, to this vector c, to this normal vector. I'm not sure to what extent you use the term normal vector in your previous linear algebra course. You might have used it, um, but you probably definitely used it if you've taken computer graphics or something before because normal vectors are a pretty big deal in graphics. Here are some facts that are actually restatements of um, facts from the previous lecture, just using that vector notation. Um, this is the kind of thing that I would have, by the time you watch this, probably have already talked about in a live lecture, so I'm not going to um, push it any further in this video. What I will observe, though, is if we name these sets S1 and S2, so S1 would be the half space of all points uh, in, intuitively speaking, I guess, on or below a particular plane, and this would be on or above that plane. Um, there's this question that the next slide is going to pose, which is, what about if I ask um, for the set of points that are actually on the boundary, that are on the plane, defined by c dot x equals b? Um, 
what I want to observe here is that um, I have these two sets that define things that are on or above or on or below the plane. And I could define the set of all points on the plane by taking the intersection of those two things. And by a property we saw in the previous lecture, if I have two convex sets and I take their intersection, then the result is guaranteed to be convex. That's a fact you might be mulling over a lot once you start working on assignment one. So we can actually demonstrate that the boundary is convex just by combining together things that we already know about the two half spaces. So why do we care? Uh, I mean, fair enough, we, have, we can define something, we can call it a half space, we can, we can uh, illustrate that it's defined by linear inequalities. Why do we care? Well, maybe we know by now that obviously linear inequalities are something we are probably going to want to spend some time thinking about in this course. Um, but suppose we've got more than one of them, which obviously we do in linear programs. So I've got a set of different linear inequalities. And if I were to um, think about some linear program, so minimize, I don't know, 3x plus um, 4y subject to the following two constraints. x plus y is less than or equal to negative 5 and uh, 3x minus y or whoops 3y minus x is less than or equal to 0. If I want to consider points that could be the optimal solution to this LP, what I need are points x, y that satisfy all of the constraints. So both of the two constraints that are present. I need to find points that are um, inside of both of these two half spaces. In other words, what I want are these points here in the intersection of the two half spaces. And we know that each half space by itself is convex. And now that we realize that what we're looking for, our feasible region, is the intersection of these convex half spaces, we can conclude by the property that two, the intersection of two convex sets is convex, we can conclude that the, feasible, that the intersection of two half spaces is convex. And therefore, if I take the intersection of n half spaces, if the intersection, well, the intersection could be empty or non-empty, but in both cases, it will be a convex set. And so now maybe this ties back into why we were talking about convexity and, of course, about linear programming. It's because the feasible region um, of a linear program is either empty, in which case it is formally still convex, or it is a non-empty convex set.